It's been a year since King Charles was crowned as the UK's monarch, but the last 12 months have not gone to plan. So, what have been the highs and lows for King Charles? Hello and welcome to Roundtable, Amanda Brady. King Charles waited longer than any other British heir apparent to take the throne. His first year as monarch has been overshadowed by health scares, mishaps and family squabbles. Let's look back at some of the biggest moments. Pomp and circumstance fit for a king. The UK's first coronation in 70 years. King Charles finally crowned. He had decades to prepare for becoming head of Britain's royal family, but he had big shoes to fill. I think generally opinion is that uh, he's doing better than that was expected. I think, uh, you know, obviously the, the love of the Queen, it was a, a hard act to follow. But um, I think he's doing, doing a pretty good job, yes. As Prince, environmental issues were key to his charity and campaign work. As monarch, he attended the COP28 conference in Dubai. I have seen across the Commonwealth and beyond countless communities which are unable to withstand repeated shocks, whose lives and livelihoods are laid waste by climate change. Surely, real action is required to stem the growing toll of its most vulnerable victims. A few months after this, following a routine prostate procedure, King Charles told the nation and the world his medical team had discovered cancer. He had to step away from public duties while undergoing treatment. Around the same time, the Princess of Wales, Catherine, also disappeared from public view after undergoing surgery. Speculation about where's Kate seemed to dominate the national conversation. A photo was released for Mother's Day showing the princess and her children but it was soon pulled by agencies over fears it had been photoshopped, and this fueled even more rumors. Eventually, Catherine broke her silence, saying she too had cancer and was receiving preventive chemotherapy. As far as we know, she is still recovering. And then there is Prince Harry. His trips to the UK are few and far between and usually involve legal action. He is suing a number of newspapers over alleged hacking and the UK government over his security arrangements. Polls, though, show the royal family remains popular with the British public, the Prince and Princess of Wales being the most loved. The King has seen an increase from 49 to 56 percent since his coronation. The monarch recently returned to work and hopes to increase his public duties. He's also taken on 200 new charities. After waiting so long to become King, Charles clearly has big plans for the next 12 months. Well, let's bring in our guests. Norman Baker is former UK Home Office Minister with the Liberal Democrat Party. He's campaigned in favour of the UK becoming a republic. And he's also the author of And What Do You Do? What the Royal Family Don't Want You to Know. Sarah Hewson is a journalist with over 20 years' experience, much of it covering the Royal Family. Afia Hagen is also a journalist and royal commentator and one of the UK's leading voices on diversity issues. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. Sarah, I'll start with you. It's been a torrid first year for Charles, hasn't it? it? It really has. We talked about the King as being a man in a hurry. This was a job that he had waited his entire adult life for. And he had a big plan and he's had to press the pause button because of his shock cancer diagnosis. And it has been deeply frustrating for him to have to step back for the last few months and to find himself behind closed doors, confined to barracks, effectively going through his red boxes, but really little limited contact apart from with the Prime Minister and, and a few others. And we have, of course, in the last few weeks started to see him coming back out into public life. And you can see just how important that has been. But he's missed a lot. Afia, his late mother used to say that the monarch had to be seen, mm. had to be out there, had to be, you know, someone that the public could 
see in person and yeah. relate to. Yeah. And he hasn't really been able to do that very much. Yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, she used to say that you have to be seen to be believed. And he hasn't been able to do that at all in, in the way that he would like. You know, this first year of his reign was about connecting with people. After the Queen died, we saw him do that quite unprecedented walkabout outside Buckingham Palace. And that kind of set the tone for his reign and the kind of monarchy that he was going to have. And this year was supposed to be about Commonwealth visits, you know, potentially Australia, Canada. You've got the Commonwealth heads of government meeting in Samoa later on this year. And visiting these countries, being amongst the people uh, and being able to be out there and connecting with people. And, you know, the monarchy exists because of the people. It has to maintain that popularity. And if he's not able to be out there and sprinkle that bit of stardust, then that is really problematic. And he really likes to do that. That's where he's happiest. You know, we've seen him at garden parties now that he's sort of back out on public duties, well, limited public duties. And we've seen how happy he is when he gets to meet people. And so, yes, him not being seen, not being out there, being back in the barracks, as Sarah said, has been increasingly difficult for him. Norman, I've seen him at garden parties, but I've never met Charles. What's he like? You've spent time with him. Well, in some ways, he's quite endearing. I mean, last time I met him, he was very keen to tell me about his uh, vegetable oil, recycled vegetable oil powering his the royal train. So he takes these things seriously if he doesn't always follow his own advice, I might say, in terms of transport. But on a personal level, I feel quite sorry for him because he had waited a long time to come to the throne and he's not been able to do very much, really, not, notwithstanding his intentions. Uh, and, of course, he's not been helped by Harry and Meghan disappearing off to one side, Prince Andrew being a thorn in the side on the other side. Um, so it's been difficult for him. But, you know, the royal family was, to some extent, fossilised because the Queen was there for such a long time and nothing much changed during her reign. And yet the Britain in 1952, when she came to the throne, is so different from the Britain mm -hmm. now. And the royal family hasn't really moved in the same way with the population and the country at large. Now, Charles, we were led to believe, was going to modernise the monarchy. He hasn't really done so. No doubt his health has been a big drawback there. But, you know, the royal family has to actually move forward, otherwise it's in some danger. Sarah, you've interviewed him. Mm -hmm. What's your impression of Charles as a man when you sit down and you're talking to him one-on-one? -on -one? He is a, a man who is extremely well-read. He has a tremendous work ethic. He is a workaholic. His sons talk about finding himself, him falling asleep uh, on his books and papers. He's not someone who wants to skim the surface when he gets his red boxes. He wants to be across every single detail, and that is why, for him, to have had to take this step back has been deeply uh, frustrating for him. He's a man of big beliefs. He is a man who was for many years misunderstood but was actually ahead of his time if you think about his views on the environment and climate change and how he was ridiculed for those. But actually, that is now mainstream thought. He's a very passionate man. He is a man with opinions that haven't always been in tune with the mood at the moment, uh, as I said. But, but, you know, those opinions, we thought, might have to be buried when he became monarch. There was concern about how he would adjust to becoming a monarch. I think we've seen that he has been able to combine the two roles. He headed to the COP summit uh, in the UAE uh, late last year, and he was still able to speak out on the issue of the environment because it is something that he feels transcends politics, that he believes it is his duty to speak out on. And he has his late mother's sense of duty. And I think that's what we're seeing now, his determination to get back to work uh, and to his duty and putting that above all else. Afia, I want to talk about the relationship with Harry, who mm. was in London last week, as we yeah. saw for his Invictus Games. Wonderful work he's done with that charity and everything he has achieved. Mm -hmm. But the royal family couldn't find five minutes in Charles's diary for them to meet. I mean, it's not a good look, is it? It's not a good look. I think it looks like it is a snub on behalf of the king towards his son, Prince Harry, and that's not going to be very good for the king. The optics on this are absolutely terrible at best. And I think it's a real shame, actually, that nobody from the royal family took the time out to celebrate not Prince Harry, but the Invictus Games. Uh, the service in London last week was all about celebrating 10 years of the Invictus Games and the incredible work that has been achieved by Prince Harry, you know, the founding patron and everybody else that is involved. Um, but yes, you know, the fact that 
back in February, we had Prince Harry making this massy dash, as you will, back to the UK after hearing his father's cancer diagnosis. I think we all thought that, you know, relations could be thawing between them, but actually, you know, things are looking up. Perhaps we are on the road to reconciliation, but it feels like now we are nowhere near that. The fact that they were literally two miles away from each other. So, uh, King Charles III and Queen Camilla were at a garden party and Prince Harry was at St Paul's Cathedral at, for that Invictus Game surgery. They were lit, um, service, excuse me. They were literally within two miles of each other, but there's no space in the diary for a lunch, for a 30 minute meeting. I find that very, very hard to believe. And like I said, this looks like a snub and it's, it's terrible for royal unity. And this is the thing, is that King Charles III, especially when it comes to the Commonwealth, when he gave his Commonwealth speech earlier on this year, he talked about togetherness and unity within the Commonwealth. But if you don't have that within your own family, you can't preach that to 50 something other countries and expect them to believe you. It's not going to wash. Norman, what do you make of the relationship with Harry? I mean, it is a soap opera, the world looks in. I know you're a Republican and you're not in any way a monarchist but people are interested in what's going on. Oh, people are interested. And I think, as I read it from the outside, um, the issue for Charles and his entourage is Meghan, largely, rather than Harry. And they're worried that whatever they say to Harry will end up on American television uh, the following week, and that's a restriction. But on the Mercy Dash, it was just referred to earlier in the year. I mean, that was a 30-minute interview only. I mean, it wasn't really a... He came all the way from America and got 30 minutes with the king. It wasn't a huge amount. OK, Charles wasn't very well, you might, you might argue, but nevertheless, that, was, that looked like a bit of a snub to me at that particular point. It doesn't, it doesn't bode well. And actually, on just a purely family basis, they ought to try and make up. But that, in a way, that's not my business or anyone else's business. It's a family matter for them to sort out. Sarah, I thought it was quite poignant in a way that the only people who turned out from his family to support Harry were actually Diana's siblings. Charles Spencer and Lady Jane Fellows, brother and sister of the late Princess of Wales, Diana. Um, how do you think that left Harry feeling? I mean, on the one hand, wonderful that they came to his church service, but he must be desperately sad inside. And I thought it was really sad to see him cutting such a lonely figure there at St Paul's. He wasn't there with Meghan. And I think many of us would have expected Meghan to be here to support him at such an important event because she has been so much involved in the Invictus Games. This is his legacy project. It has changed people's lives. It has saved people's lives. And Meghan has been so much a part of that. I don't think she feels welcome in the United Kingdom. She has no desire to come back here and to be part of the, the circus effectively. And so we saw him walking into St Paul's by himself, as you say, Earl Spencer, Lady Jane Fellows there to support him. No other members of the royal family there. They talk about the Invictus family, and that is Harry's family. And that certainly was when he was back in the United Kingdom last week. No reunion with his father, no prospect of any kind of reconciliation with his brother. It's really sad to see. And I know that, you know, a lot has been said and done. But we're always told by Buckingham Palace that as far as the King's concerned, the door is always open to his son. It didn't feel like that way when Harry was back. Afia, I want to talk about Meghan. Sarah said she doesn't feel welcome in this country. I mean, is it from the royal family she doesn't feel welcome? The, the British public, I think, to begin with, were very welcoming to her. Yeah, to begin with, but then you have the, the British press, which literally turned her into cannon fodder, um, who decided that they had a vendetta against her for whatever reason, a variety of reasons, um, and decided that she would be the target uh, for the royal family, perhaps to take the heat off other members, or perhaps they just, you know, decided that she was the one. You are the one that we are going to drag down. And they have continually done that. I mean, literally, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, hasn't been in this country since uh, the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. But when you look at how many articles are written about her on a daily basis, it's, it's hundreds. But it's she gets hundreds. the clicks. That's what it's all she, about, isn't she it? She gets the clicks, but it doesn't mean that it's good journalism. It doesn't mean that it's valuable journalism. And it doesn't mean that half of it is even true. And so I think that she felt that coming to the United Kingdom would just make her 
it's her boy's cannon fodder and she doesn't want a bar of it. She doesn't want to be part of it. And I think she feels, like Sarah so rightly said, that she doesn't feel welcome in the United Kingdom. And I think that's a mixture of from sections of the British public, and it's not all of the British public at all, but from sections of the British public, from the tabloid press, and probably from the royal family as well. Well, let's take a look at who is popular with the royal family uh, and the British public. So, King Charles, he's not the most popular royal. Uh, he's not even third. So the Prince and Princess of Wales are the most popular amongst the royals, with 62% and 61% of Britain's polled saying they have a favourable opinion of William and Catherine. 56% of Britain's polled favour Princess Anne, and half say they have a favourable impression of King Charles. Bottom of the list, Prince Harry with 23%, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, with 18%, and Prince Andrew with 8%. Um, who are the 8% who like Prince well, Andrew? <laughs> Precisely. It's extraordinary that you've even got 8% after everything that's gone on. Look, I mean, uh, actually, the press, what the press do is very important because it forms opinions. And, uh, you know, they like to have goodies and baddies always. They don't like things in the middle because they don't sell papers. They like people who are really good or people who are really bad in their eyes. And that's how they present matters. And it's been in the same in the past um, with other royals as well, going back to Fergie and everything else in, in, in the olden days. I can tell... Hmm? Camilla as and Camilla, well. of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you that when I, uh, I write articles for national papers, as you know, in the world, I've been told they know where I come from. And these are papers which are broadly pro-monarchy. And he said to me, you can write what you like, you can write anything about Harry and Meghan, but don't lie about William and Kate. And that's what yeah. he told me. And that's, that's the kind of editorial guidance to people like me writing articles. I write anything else, but I can't touch them. So, of course, that affects the public perception of individual royals if they're only getting one side of the story. Mm. They're not well, we're not well served by the press in this country as far as the royals are concerned. They're either highly intrusive, because they are sometimes. You know, there's that issue of some helicopter looking into Harry's bedroom, you remember that? Uh, which is out, absolutely out of order. Or long-lens photographs of the royals mm. on beaches and so on, mm. which is completely intrusive. Or, but they don't actually deal with the real stuff, which they should deal with, like how much the royals cost, how much power they have behind the scenes. Those issues which are important to our democracy and our constitution are just not covered by the press. But they bring an awful lot of money into Britain. Well, so, the, so you know, do you know what the palace in, in Europe with the most visitors is? It's the Palace of Versailles, where the French abolished the monarchy in 1848. And I whatever you're, whether you're pro-monarchist or not, I don't think we should base our constitution on what tourism does for us. Yeah. Sarah, I want to talk about Catherine, Princess of Wales. Obviously, a young mother struggling with a very serious diagnosis. Any update on how she is or when we might see her in public again? No. Um, so, obviously, we had the video statement uh, from the Princess of Wales where she revealed her cancer diagnosis for the first time, and that is news that she and, and Prince William had been grappling with and how they would break that news to their children and found themselves at the centre of a social media storm, uh, conspiracy theories going wild, uh, and then uh, had to reveal that news to the public. And since then, they were very clear in that statement that she needed time to heal, to recover, to regain her strength, to do her best to get as healthy as possible, but also to be there for their children as well. And it was very clear in that that she wants to come back to work but she can't do that until she is ready to do so. And, and so we're not going to get a running commentary. We don't know any more uh, about her health and, and how she's doing, except that she is going through preventative chemotherapy and that she'll be back as and when she's fit. And we, we all hope that. And nor should we go a running commentary. I agree 100% with it's, you, Norman. It's a personal it is... matter. It's a health yeah. matter. Yeah. We don't ask for individuals who are MPs or anyone else what their health situation is. No. Why should we ask the royal family? You know, I want to talk about the royal family in terms of what their constitutional arrangements are, not about how, what their personal health problems are. She should be left alone. And, and I think that's why there's a big difference between the king, who was very open yes. about his diagnosis, and the Princess of Wales, and she came under huge pressure to reveal what yes. was going on. But it's very different. She's not the monarch. No. In fact, she's not even a born into the royal family. No. She married into no. it. She has no constitutional no. Uh, role. And I think they were perfectly within their rights to maintain that. It's, it's nobody's policy. business. Yeah. Afia, do you think Catherine was bullied into making that video statement? I mean, there was some terrible things being said online. Yeah. None of it true, all of it scurrilous. 
I felt very sorry for her at that time. I did as well. I don't think she was bullied into making that statement. I think for herself and her family, that was the right time for her to be able to be more open about what you know the cause of her absence from public life had been. But I think tying in with what you said about the British press, the British press have created this sense of entitlement. Yeah. So certain members of the British public, royal watchers, people in the media, people in the press, feel that they are owed an explanation as to why she's disappeared. And you, therefore, when you have this vacuum of information, the vacuum has to be filled, and it was filled with utter nonsense. Yeah. It's and also the Wild West on social media, oh my though, goodness. as well, yeah. isn't it? I mean, yeah. absolutely. And that's what filled that vacuum. People had a sense of entitlement, that they needed to know what was going on with her. So I don't think she was bullied into making that statement. I think that she felt it was the right time, and it came. It really came to a head in that particular week when I think about it. In the beginning of the week, we'd had um, the video of her at, at the farm shop, and pre previous to that, we'd had, you know, a tabloid news agency, TMZ, had had a picture of her, and then you'd had the whole Mother's Day picture thing. At the beginning of that week, we had the video, and, and I think we thought, okay, well, if we've got the video with her, but it actually sort of fueled the conspiracy theories even more. And so, but the end of that week was also Easter holidays. So it was perfect time for her to be able to tell her children what was going on, but then bring them back into the family fold without them having to go to school with, you know, people saying, oh, your mum's got this, your mum's got that. Um, and so she could tell the public what was going on. So I don't think she was forced into doing it. I don't think she was bullied into doing it. I think she felt that she had to do it. But let's also recognise that Kensington Palace in their PR and communications handled this terribly. In terms of crisis management, this is a textbook example of how not to do that. How not to do it, Sarah. Yes, uh, I guess, and I'm not going to sit here and defend the, the kind of their PRs because they're paid to do a job, but if you have a couple, the principals, as they're called, mm -hmm. who are desperately guarding their privacy and do not want to say anything, and, of course, the biggest kind of PR disaster came when uh, Prince William didn't show up for his godfather's memorial yes. service. And then where was he in this no-show and how dare he not show up? We now subsequently started, know yeah. that that was when Kate had received the news that actually she had got cancer. And of course we now all understand in hindsight, but they weren't able to say any more. And was that PR strategy gone wrong or was that a couple who said no? Absolutely, you do not reveal a single thing about this because this is private and this is about our family and no one else yeah. has the right to know. They should have said that, actually. Should have said from the palace, this is a private health matter, it's nobody's business. But I think they felt that they'd set out at the beginning and said, the Princess of Wales has had surgery, she's going to be recovering at Windsor Castle, she's going to be off until at least Easter. They'd said it, they'd done yeah. it. What they didn't bank on and, and should have, and it was naivety, was that in this information vacuum, these wild theories. Would it just was relentless, and wasn't it? But it, it was really relentless. Of its own. But the problem was as well that parallel to this, you had Buckingham Palace being much more open about King Charles III. So it made the Princess of Wales conspicuous by her absence. Yes. So even though Prince Charles, you know, we knew about his enlarged prostate and then we knew about the cancer diagnosis, we did then see him going to appointments. We saw him at meeting with Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister. We saw him sort of opening cards and looking at gifts that he had been sent by members of the public uh, wishing him well. But we saw in parallel, Princess of Wales, we saw absolutely nothing. And so you had these two streams going on at the same time. The Princess of Wales is conspicuous by her absence. King Charles III apparently has the same thing, but is out and about and walking. And the two things just didn't make sense. And I totally agree that, you know, it's a private health matter. We're not entitled to all the details and all the information. But we have to agree that this should have been handled much better than it was. Just looking ahead, Trooping the colour, a big summer, Royal Ascot. How much of a boost do you think it would give people in the UK to see Charles fit and healthy and maybe Catherine make a public appearance as well? I, I don't expect we'll be seeing the Princess of Wales making any public appearances anytime soon. Um, it would be wonderful mm -hmm. to see that because, of course, everybody just wants to know that she's OK. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were the conspiracy theories, but a lot of the, the, this clamouring for information came out of care. 
yeah. wanting to know that she was OK. With the King, look, we've seen him at the Buckingham Palace garden parties. We've got uh, Trooping the Colour coming up, the King's birthday parade. We are told that if he's able to, he would like not just to be there, but to be leading from the front on his favourite horse, Noble. There's also the 80th anniversary of D-Day, big commemorations to be taking place in Normandy. He would very much like to be a part of that. Royal Ascot, which was so important to his late mother, we would expect, perhaps, if he's able to, to see him for a day there. And then we have the incoming state visit from the Emperor and Empress of Japan. So he's not going to be playing, as Buckingham Palace uh, tell us, a, a full part in what is the busiest time of the year for the royal families, but he will be doing as much as he is physically able to mm -hmm. with the guidance of his doctors at all times. Norman, it would lift the, the nation, the Commonwealth, the UK. People would really get a, a boost this summer when they see the King back, wouldn't they? Well, I wouldn't want to oversell that. And I'm sure on a personal basis, people want to wish him well and hope he'll fully recover. And that's just a human reaction to a difficult situation for someone in that position, um, who's been subject to considerable attention, which most people who will become ill don't have to deal mm -hmm. with. But, you know, I wouldn't want to oversell the fact that the population at large is, is uh, there clamouring for this. The but newspapers... Do you think it was quite destabilising, though, when we had the news that the King had cancer, the Princess of Wales had cancer? And actually, when you look at the conspiracy theories, there were other rogue states that were able to play into that. Well, they may Because well have they been. know that it um, has a destabilising effect. Well, they may well have been, because um, you also had Prince Andrew, of course, who was out of action, as it were. You were Harry and Meghan who were out of action. So the number of people who are actually doing anything is far fewer than it would have been some time ago. So that was a factor that played in there. But, you know, uh, at any one time, there's between 20 and 45% of the population who believe there should be a republic, uh, which doesn't mean they're hostile to Charles, personally. They're not hostile to Charles, but they just think that in a democracy, we ought to have an elected head of state. Norman, Sarah, Afia, that's all we have time for. The clock has beaten us. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see there, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching. <laughs>